Tim from One Asset Farm Special DNA Heirloom Livestock. Today we are talking about the top three things that you need to consider when thinking about organic worming options for your sheep and goats. Stay tuned to find out more. Okay, so it's Tim again from One Asset Farm Special DNA Heirloom Livestock. So today we're talking about organic wormers. Holy smokes, talk about a hot subject. When it comes to antibiotics and wormers, there is uh, some serious uh, debate on this as far as what works and what doesn't. So I wanna talk to you about the three basic things that I want you to consider when you think about your organic wormers for your sheep and goats. Now listen, uh, I got a day job. Um, I'm, I work with people medicine. I work with evidence-based practice, science. Um, I like to see the numbers. So I do a lot of research so you don't have to. I know a lot of what I tell you isn't necessarily popular and you may not like it, but I'm trying to give you the best information that I can. I spend a lot of time reading over university studies, uh, finding out what's best evidence-based practice based on professional scientists out in the field. And it may surprise you um, that science agrees. Yes, science agrees that there are lots of organic options that work really, really well uh, to help keep sheep and goats uh, parasite, um, not parasite free, but uh, keep the parasite amount down in the animals. Um, when it comes to gastrointestinal worms in sheep and goats, we're primarily talking about the barber's pole worm. This is our number one worm that our sheep and goats tend to get. Uh, you know, when we talk about organic medications, um, lots of medications are out there, even for people who have organic sources. You know, aspirin was originally made from willow tree bark, um, atropine, foxglove flowers. Um, you've got arsenic, you've got other things that, you know, these are, these are organic things that are, are cyanide. These are organic. These are things that are made in, in nature. Um, just because something's natural, quote unquote, does not mean that it's more dangerous, does not mean that it's more safe. Now, most of us are somewhere um, in the middle. Uh, we say, okay, I want it to be as organic and as friendly environmentally as I can be to a point. And where, where you tend to lose me is when we start talking about animal death. I do as much as I can on my farm to keep my animals safe and keep everything organic, but am I willing to let them die um, without giving them a chemical wormer or without giving them an antibiotic? No, that's where you lose me. Um, some people overdose their animals just like humans, you know, when it comes to antibiotics, when it comes to things, you can overdo it and that's bad. Some people just say, well, no, absolutely not. There's no way I'm gonna give any kind of chemical or any kind of antibiotic and, and that's your choice. But in the end, uh, I think you need to plan um, for the worst and hope for the best. Um, I want you to do what you can uh, to keep your animals worm free in a safe organic method, but I also want you to be prepared in case things get out of hand and you need to reach for some of those stronger medications. Now, with that being said, point number one that I wanna to make to you today is that worming, if you're raising sheep and goats, worming is going to be one of the most complicated, time-consuming, uh, responsibility-based things that you're going to do. Now, some people are gonna argue with this and say, no, no, uh, worming's fine, it's easy. Um, and I'm going to argue that and I'm going to say, no, uh, you have to be really, really cautious. And here's the reason why. If you get to know the barber's pull worm, if you get to understand what it's all about in the way that the barber's pull worm works, what you'll find is a couple very interesting points. And two of those points I really want to hammer home to you. And those two points are this point number one, 10 to 20 percent of the animals in your flock are carrying 70 to 80 percent of the worm load. Um, that is very important for you to understand. Um, and it can be very difficult to understand which of these animals is carrying and which one's not. It takes a lot of time and effort and book work and keeping track of your animals and keeping numbers written down in order for you to determine which animals are the healthiest ones out of the flock and which ones aren't. Uh, the other thing that I want you to consider once you get to know the barber's pull worm is that it works in very sneaky ways. Uh, it, is not, it, it is not as simple as the animal just ingests the worm, the worm lays eggs inside of them, and, and the cycle goes round and round. When an animal, like a sheep or a goat, actually 
ingests a worm, that worm can choose, yes, choose to do one of two things. It can either go into a hibernation mode uh, to where it just hangs out and doesn't really do anything, or it can begin to infest the animal. And what we found, what science has found, is in a lot of cases that barber's pole worm goes into the animal and it waits until just the right time to start wreaking havoc on the animal. And as a matter of fact, that right time tends to be triggered by things like uh, temperature, outside temperature, and hormonal changes within the animal. Ewes and does, uh, you will find the barber's pole worm really kicks into high gear two weeks prior to lambing or kidding and up to eight weeks after. Um, this is due to a change in the hormones within the ewe or the doe um, and really starts to wreak havoc on that animal at a very inopportune time, mind you. You know, the barber's pole worm causes damage to the internal lining that mucosa is what we call it, the lining of the intestines. And when it damages that lining, uh, the animal's body goes into overtime trying to repair that. It's taking all the protein, all the nutrition, not all of it, but a majority of the protein and a majority of the nutrition, and it's trying to build back up that intestinal lining. And so when you're feeding your animals, even feeding them correctly, and they have a worm load, uh, you're you're taking a lot of that feed that you're giving them and you're putting it towards uh, fixing damage instead of putting it towards bone growth, muscle growth, milk production, and things like that. So that's very important for you to understand. The barber's pole worm can take in up to 10% of that host's total blood volume uh, in, in a day, in a 24 hour period, 10%. Uh, of that blood volume is going to that parasite instead of going to the animal. So again, very important for you to understand um, that what's going on there with, with the barber pole uh, worm. Point number two that I want to make to you today is in regard to the organic wormers themselves. Uh, there's two specific organic wormers that have been studied that have been shown to work. Um, there's one on the market that gets pushed really, really hard that doesn't work at all. Um, and I want to get that one out of the way right off the bat. If you look at this right here, ah, yes, diatomaceous earth. How many of you have seen this? If you are putting this into your animal, if you're putting this into a drench or some kind of liquid form or putting it on their food and they're ingesting it, um, you are wasting your money. Uh, I'm not going to get too much into that, but what I'm going to tell you is, is once this stuff gets wet, it doesn't work. Uh, diatomaceous earth works great for all kinds of things, but it doesn't work. And I will double, triple down on this. It doesn't work for internal parasites. Stop using diatomaceous earth. You're wasting your time, you're wasting your money, and you're putting your animals at increased risk. What does work? Two things. Garlic. Um, studies have shown, there's been plenty of scientific studies to show that garlic works without a doubt for barber's pole worm. Uh, the evidence shows this is, this is true. Uh, one, there was a, a lengthy scientific study that was done that showed that one teaspoon per head per animal uh, showed a significant, significant decrease in the internal parasite load, the internal um, nematode load uh, the barber's pole worm inside of sheep and goats. Um, garlic can be dangerous. Um, so I am not telling you to go out and nuke your animal with garlic. Um, garlic can cause some red blood cell disruption that can cause some problems. Um, it is not good to give in large quantities. There are plenty of videos out there. I am not going to make a worming your animals with garlic video. That would be a waste of my time and a waste of your time. There are plenty of good videos out there that you can look up. I may even throw a link down below uh, talking about how to make a good warmer out of garlic. Uh, with that being said, I have no desire, nor will you probably ever see me um, utilizing uh, garlic to warm my animals. I personally feel that uh, the next one that I'm going to talk to you about is probably the best. Now, you may not know this, but prior to uh, the chemical warmers that we use today, like ivermectin and cydectin and some of these other warmers, uh, farmers used to use copper sulfate. 
Uh, copper sulfate was used and used successfully for many, many, many years. Uh, and it has been shown through very stringent scientific studies uh, that it does in fact stop uh, worm loads from getting, uh, getting out of control. Uh, I keep using, and you may notice I have a little hesitancy in my voice when I, when I, I stop myself short from saying eliminating worms. All animals on your farm are going to have some parasite load. It may be very, very slight, um, but if anyone ever tells you I have absolutely no uh, parasites, if people start using the terms like never and always with you, you should probably be a little hesitant. I mean, we're all adults here. Uh, usually when people start using terms like always and never, you know what that means. So I'll, I'll, just, I'll just leave that there. Um, but copper sulfate, 1% copper sulfate solution is what was used, 1% or 1.75%. Um, there was a research study done at the University of Kentucky that was wrapped up in 2011. I have never personally met uh, the young lady that did the study, although I have read uh, her work. Um, her name, if I remember correctly, was Melanie Simpson. I don't know her if anybody out there knows Melanie. Uh, have her contact me. I'd love to talk with her. But she devoted three years of her life at the University of Kentucky uh, to do a study on copper sulfate use, uh, antithelmic use in worming uh, sheep. Uh, they did a study on Hampshire sheep. And copper scares the hell out of people uh, when you say copper and sheep because most of us sheep producers know that copper is toxic to sheep. When I think copper, I think dead sheep. Um, and that is not copper sulfate, that's these things right here, uh, copper boluses, these are things that we give to goats. This is not what I'm talking about. I, I am talking about copper sulfate. Copper sulfate is this here, you may recognize this from our hoof rot video. Um, you can buy this in bulk from Amazon. Um, you buy it at your big box store, but it's going to cost you twice as much. So a 1% copper sulfate solution. Uh, in water, orally drenched to animals at a rate of 100 milliliters per head for adults and 50 milliliters per head for babies, uh, significantly cuts down on uh, the amount of worm load inside the animal. Um, the last one that I'm going to talk about is tannins. Uh, tannins are kind of my honorable mention here. Tannins are uh, don't necessarily destroy uh, or kill the worms. It just helps to increase uh, protein synthesis within the animal, keeps them healthier, um, and helps them to uh, work from there. So yeah, so those are the wormers, the organic wormers that you, you can and should consider. Uh, the third point that I wanna get to is, is there's a whole lot more to worming than just wormers in general. Um, and I kind of alluded to that in regards to the tannins. Uh, overall, uh, overall health and nutrition of your livestock goes a long, long way when it comes to preventing uh, worms from getting out of control. Uh, a lot of times these animals are uh, holding a certain amount of worm load and those worms are just waiting for an opportune time uh, to flourish. And that can be uh, illness, times of poor nutrition, uh, so on and so forth. So those are the top three things that I want you to consider when it comes to your organic wormers. Now we are going to be making a video, a follow-up video to this one very soon within the next seven days um, that will cover how to actually make uh, copper sulfate, 1% uh, copper sulfate wormer, uh, and how to administer that to your sheep and goats. So keep an eye out for that. For those of you that are watching this, like the day it comes out, um, that video is not up yet. But for those of you that are catching this uh, later on down the road, I'm sure the video is already out there. Um, I will update this video when we make our copper sulfate video so you can find that information in the link below. Um, so a few things I'm going to include below that I hope you look up. Uh, the first thing I'm going to include below is a good link uh, to one of our other uh, partner channels or friends out there. Uh, that make a garlic wormer. I'll have that in the comments below. I'll have our copper sulfate video in the comments below when we make it. Um, and I'm also going to include, if you, it's deep reading, but if you're interested in reading, I'm also going to include a link to the University of Kentucky uh, graduate thesis study on copper sulfate for warming as well. 
So with that being said, that's all I've got for you today. As always, thanks for watching our channel. It is greatly appreciated. My name is Tim from Lanessa Farm Specialty and Heirloom Livestock, and we will see you next time.